So my name is Nancy Brickhouse, and I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce today's colloquium speaker, Randall Smith. Um, Randall obtained his bachelor's degree from Carnegie Mellon in math and physics, and in 1997, his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in physics with Don Cox. His thesis was entitled Modeling the Soft X-ray Background with Multiple Supernovae. He did a postdoc term with Ellie Black, and then I hired him here as a postdoc around 2000 to work on an X-ray spectroscopy modeling package, originally developed by John Raymond, and now it's known as Adam DB. These spectral models are widely used in X-ray astronomy, and Randall's paper in 2001 already has over 1,400 citations, from, mostly from people who are using the models. So Randall's been active in a number of X-ray missions and has broad interest in X-ray spectra of many different objects. He's also been instrumental in refurbishing the SAO electron beam ion trap, which is located out at Cambridge Discovery Park. This is an experimental device that creates a high, in, high, dense, high energy plasma that we can use to benchmark the spectroscopy models. Most of you already also know that he's currently serving as the Associate Director of the High Energy Astrophysics Division here at the CFA. So today, Randall's going to tell us about an X-ray spectroscopy mission called ARCUS, for which he is the principal investigator. Thank you, Nancy. Um, so this is going to be sort of a hybrid talk. Uh, it's mostly my standard talk about the ARCUS Explorer. Uh, with some new slides based on the work that we've been looking at for the new uh, upcoming proposal submission. Uh, it also has, since this is sort of a hometown audience, a few comments on the side about how uh, you might be able to get involved in missions in the future. Uh, so some advice for early career folks, maybe some postdocs. Um, and it also has a few words on laboratory astrophysics and what, uh, what the needs are in that area, since as Nancy mentioned, it's been a long time concern of mine. Uh, the first thing I'm gonna do though, is use this. So for those of you who wish that the speaker would go through their entire talk in three minutes, so that you could dial off and be done with your, your the day, here is Arcus in three minutes with some nice background music. When we look into the night sky, we see planets, stars, and sometimes even distant galaxies. This simulation shows how stars and galaxies assembled after the Big Bang, first building up small systems that grew into larger ones. As the universe evolved, matter clumped into filaments, which then merged into small galaxies and then into larger groups and clusters. Inside these galaxies, stars live and die, exploding and forming black holes of all sizes. But this is not the whole story. These galaxies are embedded in halos of gas that are being pulled in by gravity, but expelled by jets and winds from black holes and supernova explosions. These gas halos contain 80% of the normal matter in the universe. They hold the key to understanding just how the zoo of galaxies, large and small, formed and evolved into the cosmos we know today. We've searched with infrared, optical, and UV light and found cool and warm gas in these halos, but much still eludes us. Is this a surprise? Not really. The same processes that expel the gas also heat it to millions of degrees, so hot it only interacts with X-rays. Without observations to ground them, simulations are only as good as their assumptions. Make a different choice, and the predicted gas halos can be very different as shown in these two simulations. Astronomers detect these halos using bright background sources, such as supermassive black holes as X-ray flashlights. Unfortunately, existing telescopes haven't generally been sensitive to faint features of the missing hot gas. Recently, the XMN Newton X-ray telescope observed the brightest background black hole for almost a month and found evidence of two gas halos. This was an important achievement, but one impossible to repeat. Arcus will provide more than an order of magnitude more sensitivity than existing X-ray telescopes such as Chandra or XMN Newton. This will allow observations of dozens of X-ray sources to measure just how far gas extends and how hot it is, with observation times measured in days or hours rather than weeks. 
Two recent technological breakthroughs in X-ray optics and gratings make the Arcus mission possible. X-rays are challenging to focus because like skipped rocks on a pond, they will only reflect at shallow angles. Arcus repurposes silicon wafer technology from the electronics industry to make a new kind of X-ray mirror, the silicon pore optic. These optics are assembled robotically, saving both time and money. Like all transmission gratings, critical angle transmission, or CAT gratings, consist of a series of narrowly spaced parallel bars that diffract photons. Finally, Arcus detects the X-rays and builds up a spectrum using CCDs similar to those in the Chandra and Suzaku X-ray telescopes. These X-ray gratings and optics have been in development for years. Thanks to an international collaboration of scientists and engineers, we have brought them together and demonstrated that they achieve the improved sensitivity needed for the Arcus mission. Arcus will access unexplored hunting grounds in the cosmos, revolutionizing what we know about the provenance of missing matter and about the processes going on at the hearts of black holes and stars when they form. Okay, I rarely get to show that movie, so I thought this was an ideal opportunity to do so, um, as it basically gives the entire uh, premise of the talk in three minutes. But I'd like to go a little bit, and this is the, uh, um, especially the, the part for uh, how do we get to, uh, to doing a proposal like this. And <clears throat> the answer is it doesn't come out of nowhere. It takes a long time and there's always a lot of backup material that goes into this before you actually get to the point of putting in a proposal. So in Arcus's case, we started, uh, this was Jay Bookbinder and I when, I, when he was still here, in December of 2013. And we put in an idea for a small explorer that was going to go on the International Space Station. Uh, it was still gonna be a soft X-ray grading spectrometer, but it was going to be mounted on the space station uh, using some new technologies to stabilize it and the optics and gratings we're talking about. That proposal wasn't selected, but it got a what NASA calls a category two rating. Now NASA has a particularly harsh way of rating um, exploring, explorer proposals. Category one is we like it, looks good to us, uh, and they'll tend to, to at least give you funding in order to continue the idea. Category two is it's as good, but not quite as good as the category ones, and they might give you money, they might not. Category three is a little bit of an oddball. It means you uh, have a good idea, but some aspect of your technology isn't ready. NASA will give you some more money to develop your technology and then tell you to come back again. And category four, which sadly is what majority of proposals get um, historically, uh, is basically go away. Uh, NASA didn't like your idea. Um, they felt that it was not plausible for some other reason. So getting a category two on our first tryout was a little disappointing. We would have loved a, a one, but it wasn't as, uh, too bad. We then reproposed for a medium explorer with a $250 million cap. That was a standalone mission. Um, we partnered with NASA Ames in order to run that mission. You really do need to partner with a NASA center or a large provider or something in order to do an explorer mission. Um, these are simply too large for an organization, even one as large as CFA, to do. Um, and by the way, you'll hear me referring to SAO throughout this talk in many places. The reason is that I find that, uh, especially when I'm dealing with uh, other institutions, uh, if I use the name CFA, people get very confused uh, about who gets funding. Um, and while the CFA is a great organization, it doesn't it ha doesn't legally have the ability to accept money and pay bills, and that can confuse spacecraft providers and so on. So I tend to use SAO when I'm talking about with this with NASA or with spacecraft providers. Uh, so then we partnered with Orbital ATK. This time we were graded category one, selected for a phase A study. Uh, and in the midst of that, OATK was bought by Northrop Grumman, which made for interesting times. Ultimately, as you I'm sure know, SphereX was selected over Arcus, um, but Arcus was encouraged to resubmit. NASA very much liked the idea. Um, they just liked SphereX slightly better. Um, and so now in 2020, we started 
we started work and we are now deep in the middle of preparing for the proposal, which is gonna be due December, 2021. So what's next here? Well, we've had the proposal due in December. If things go well, we would get a phase A start in August and then uh, submit the proposal and finish everything up in around September of 2023, so roughly a year later. In January of 2024, NASA would make a decision, and if we were so lucky as to be selected, our launch date is currently scheduled for sometime in November of 2028. So that might sound like it's a long way off, but trust me, you're actually responsible for building an entire spacecraft. Uh, November 2028 is coming faster than you might imagine. So what is Arcus really gonna be doing? Now, as you heard in the movie, the, the number one science goal is to look at how baryons cycle in and out of galaxies. This is terminology taken directly from the last decadal survey. And that's how NASA likes things to be done. They like them connected up to the decadal. These are, this is a, a major area where NASA um, likes to demonstrate that they're, they're achieving the decadal goals. The, Problem, of course, is we don't have the next decadal. We would very much like to have had the decadal by now. We were hoping to have it, but we don't. I'll get to that in just a moment, what the impact that's going to be. The second one here is to reveal how black holes impact their surroundings. And that's obviously related to this first topic because we know that black holes are a major force for blowing gas out of galaxies, you know, ending the star formation era of galaxies um, after Z equals two. Uh, so we are studying both how the gas got in and out, goes in and out of galaxies, but also what's pushing it out there. And then lastly, because you can't have an X-ray spectrometer like this without looking at stars and stellar systems, we're certainly gonna be looking at a wide range of those. And I'll cover those in a little bit. But we're looking primarily at things like how does, uh, how do stars form? Um, and how do stellar coronae generate x-rays? We're gonna have a, be able to make a survey of stellar coronae across all types of stars that emit x-rays. So Arcus covers a wide range of astrophysics. Now, I mentioned this issue about the decadal and the fact that we don't have the decadal yet, which is disappointing. But I would say that we are in safe ground to say that the question of how do the baryons get to the outer halos and how many are there and what's their properties is still very much an open question. I wouldn't agree, and I think most people would say, we know that the baryons are there. So characterizing this as a missing matter problem is probably incorrect at this point. Nobody has any doubt that the baryons are there somewhere. The question is, how hot are they? Where are they? Are they close into the galaxies? Do they get thrown far away? Did they never fall in all the way anyway? These are the open questions. And you can see that they kept this problem keeps showing up. It was mentioned in the 2001 decadal. We had a mission back then called Constellation X that was going to look at this. This was the first version of Constellation X with four satellites. Um, in 2010 decadal, it became this problem. We had a proposal that was went into the 2010 decadal called the International X-ray Observatory. I was involved in that as well. This problem was a key one there. And although we don't have a decadal, we at least have a fairly recent annual review article, which highlighted this in the way that I was saying, it's not whether the baryons have disappeared. Again, we know they haven't disappeared. It's really the question of how does feedback work? How does it distribute the gas in and around the galaxies? So how are we gonna do this? Well, it's basically the same process that's, that's being done using Hubble and cost observations, for example. You use back, bright background sources. So you have some AGN here shown as a red star and you imagine it shining through, in this case, a simulation and it hits three knots of material here, A, B, and C. And imagine if B is actually, say, passing by a low mass galaxy group. In that case, then it'll pass through the halo of that galaxy group and will pick up a certain amount of, um, of this case, absorbed oxygen seven in the spectrum. So we'll see perhaps a six milli angstrom equivalent with uh, looking at a halo at some redshift. And we might also see from this knot A, you know, a closer in halo, and then maybe a, even a, a weaker one here if we're uh, from part C here. So that's the technique. And then what we do is we make multiple observations of many different sources, 
picking up three or four. On average, we expect to see about three different absorption features per background source. So when we're planning on observing around 30, 35 such sources, which gives us about, uh, on, on average, we expect about 100 detections of absorption, which are going to range from, say, one milliangstrom up to call it 10 milliangstroms or so. We don't expect much more than 10 milliangstrom absorption features just because we're not planning on that chance is going to give us a line of sight that happens to go that close by a galaxy or in, inside a galaxy's uh, internals. But by then putting these onto a graph as a function of galactic center, galactocentric radius, and so here we'll just be using optical observations, for example, to know where the galaxies are and what their redshifts are, we can then make a plot and look at what the observed <coughs> what the observed equivalent widths are as a function of black eccentric radius and in this case here you could imagine say a very high feedback case where the gas has been thrown very far out you can imagine here the extreme case where there's uh, navarra frank nfw profile here where there's no feedback at all obviously unrealistic and then perhaps a medium feedback case and then it might you know, we don't know what happens here really past R200, or even what's called this flashback radius here of the very farthest stuff that might have gone out and then fallen back in in the simulations. So we're hoping that we would be able to measure not only the, uh, the gas out here, but maybe get a hint of stuff going on here out. Is it following this path? Is it, is it dropping off dramatically? We simply don't know. Now, all of these lines of sight are going to go straight through the Milky Way itself and our nearby neighbors. So you can imagine, for example, that not only are we going to get the, uh, <clears throat> these kind of observations for extragalactic sources, but we'll get an exquisite measure of the Milky Way halo itself and a hot halo of, say, M31. So shown here are just a few uh, lines of sight towards various sources. We're going to get all of these probing the mass, the temperature, the abundances, and the velocity of this gas, we'll be able to tell if this is moving or not. And for some of these, we'll be able to see, uh, even for the, the for M31, we'll get mass, temperature, and chemical abundances. Now, what can we do with that? Well, we can look to see if the Milky Way's halo, this hot halo, is rotating or not. So this is a uh, attempt to make this measurement um, in three different cases. So you could imagine, for example, that the hot halo is simply not rotating at all, that it's just sitting there. In that case, we get this purple case. You could imagine that it is totally co-rotating with the galaxy um, as a solid body. Probably also unrealistic, but again, detectable. And then finally, you could imagine somehow that it is rotating, but rotating at a different velocity here, say 180 kilometers a second, and perhaps falling, having gas falling in or not. So you could imagine if we do that, then, then we get a measure of both the rotation velocity here on this axis and an accretion rate of what the gas velo velocity is as it's falling in. So here are the kind of measurements that you could make with 12 megaseconds of XMM time. And the answer is basically you might be able to get a weak measurement of an accretion rate, but it's really at the one sigma level going to be anywhere from zero to two solar masses a year, which is really not constraining the problem in any interesting fashion. Whereas with Arcus, what we're going to be able to do is make a measurement that's of this accuracy here. So you can see that we can really measure, at least in this constrained domain, whether or not the, uh, the gas is rotating or not. Now, and you can see here that not only are we going to get this measurement of the rotation, but we'll even be able to tell from the shape of this curve whether or not our assumptions are correct or not. Can you do this with XMM? Can you do this with Athena even? The answer is no. Basically, the problem with Athena is, although it's going to have exquisite resolution from its microcalorimeter at harder X-rays, at the soft X-rays where the hot halo is going to be emitting or absorbing, you simply don't have that much resolution. So you, you're not that much better than what XMM is giving you. So pushing on. Um, oh, sorry, this figure did not come out well. Uh, this is a measurement of the oxygen absorption lines, and you know what? I am embarrassed by this figure, so I'm going to skip this. But one of the things that we will be able to look at is the composition of material inside the Milky Way itself. So the question, for example, of galactic oxygen, 
<clears throat> is it in gas? Is it in ice on grains? Is it contained within the grain composition itself? All of these questions are going to be answerable with Arcus. We can also measure, and this is a, a unique capability of, of x-rays, the amount of metallic iron in grains, which is important because the metallic iron in grains, and this would be actual pieces of iron metal embedded inside grains, they, <clears throat> they will act as an small antennae and have interesting effects on, for example, background absorption features of SZ effect in the, in the submillimeter. So the composition, the amount of uh, metallic iron in dust is actually a, a significant contributor to the question of trying to un untangle uh, CMB. And Arcus is gonna be able to actually measure what that composition is. Currently it's known to be 10% give or take. Um, now, moving on to those supermassive black holes, the AGNs. Arcus is gonna be looking at primarily the momentum of winds of coming out of AGN. So this is an interesting problem. We can certainly measure the column densities of these winds. We do that all the time. So you, you make measurements, but the problem is you cannot tell necessarily, you can't break the degeneracy between the distance that the cloud is away from the source and how much, uh, what the density is. So there's a, a unbreakable uh, degeneracy there. And as a result, you don't know what the actual momentum of that cloud is. Is it punching its way out of the black hole uh, into the interstellar medium and intergalactic medium? Or is it just sort of wafting out gently? Um, uh, very hard to know. One way that you can distinguish between these two is by using the changing uh, X-ray flux of the AGN itself to look at the changes in the absorption feature itself, because we know that the absorbing cloud will respond in a time-like manner to the changing X-ray uh, flux. The problem has always been that basically it took too long in order to get the changes detected before the, uh, X -ray, the, the uh, AGN change itself. So you need to be able to track the <clears throat> AGN changing and then the absorbing cloud changing in order to know what the density actually is and make the models work. With Arcus, you're gonna have the sensitivity to do that. Prior to Arcus, you simply didn't. So, and here's one of the new features that we're gonna be really focusing on. Arcus is going to be looking at a survey of AGN to a uniform limiting sensitivity. So here is, for example, one of the better observations of um, a uh, unobscured AGN. And the survey that Arcus will have is 100 AGN with central luminosity of uh, Eddington luminosity of 0.3, but ranging by an order of magnitude down and up from that. So you can imagine that we're gonna have a survey of 100 sources all with this kind of quality data where you have for, able to pull out, for example, six separate clouds in this system and then match them to say cloud seen in the UV, cloud seen in the optical, allow studying the AGN properties as a function of the Eddington luminosity. So we'll also be looking at obscured AGN. And again, this figure team came out poorly. Um, so here, for example, is an observation of the uh, Seifert type 2 Markarian 3. With Arcus in 44 kiloseconds, you get lines that are this strong. You're able to make a ratio plot <clears throat> between the resonance line and the forbidden line, which is a, sorry, forbidden line and the inner combination line, which is a density diagnostic, and directly measure the density to be basically in the range of six or so times 10 to the nine uh, per cubic centimeter. The kind of you know, distinction you can make with XMM right now is basically less than 10 to the 10 per cubic centimeter. So essentially not a constraint at all. Whereas with Arcus, you're going to get something that you can actually use another way of getting the density of the clouds that you're looking at. And from the density of the clouds, again, the momentum. Moving on to stars and stellar formation. So here, for example, is the picture uh, from Anderson Georgi, I believe, uh, courtesy of Nancy, of a star accreting material. So it's a young star splashing down here. And we've got both the stellar photosphere emitting here, the corona, you've got loops going on. What you'd like to know, for example, is what the total accretion rate is. 
The problem with getting the total accretion rate is that it's basically at the same temperature as the corona. So all of these shock gas and the uh, coronal gas are all emitting at the same time in the same place in the spectrum. If you have a high enough resolution spectrum, however, you can tell the difference between, for example, the coronal gas here and the shock gas, which has a different signature and a different velocity. Arcus will have the sensitivity in order to make those measurements for dozens of stars. And here, for example, is a case of just how many of those stars Arcus will measure across the spectrum from M stars down here, all the way up to F stars. This is all what we're planning on observing. Um, the ones with dots with crosses in them will be deep observations where we can get dielectronic recombination satellite features. That's important because if we want to understand, for example, what the <coughs> heating mechanism of the corona is, one major question is, is it equilibrium or non-equilibrium heating going on in the corona of stars? By looking at the dielectronic recombination satellite lines, we're going to be able to get a measure of whether or not uh, the the gas that's heated is in equilibrium or not. We're also going to be able to look at this question of <coughs> stars with radiative cores versus fully convective stores, uh, stars. This is an interesting problem because we have a good model of how stars with radiative cores and convective envelopes have a twisting mechanism that generates a magnetic dynamo. And that magnetic dynamo it makes the strong for the strong magnetic fields, creates the corona that we see in the sun, for example. We have a very good model that explains how the sun is, sun's corona is made. The problem is that it absolutely requires this dynamo in order to work. So how do you get x-rays in the corona of a fully convective star that doesn't have any of those? And you can see here in this luminosity plot, we don't see any giant break in the uh, in the flux here, in the, in the luminosity. The stars aren't dramatically changing as you go across this barrier. And yet, for some reason, they're all generating x-rays. This question is going to be, can only really be answered by getting good spectra across this boundary in order to understand if it's the same process, if, if something else is going on, where this is all happening. So now that's the science case for Arcus. And before I go into the... Uh, Um, how we're actually going to do this, I'd like to switch gears for a bit and just talk about some stuff that's going on here at Smithsonian in the field of laboratory astrophysics, because the X-ray spectroscopy that Arcus requires requires really excellent laboratory astrophysics. And there's some exciting news in this regard that I'd like to pass on. Now, the first thing that I'd like to start off with is that X-ray spectroscopy, and I admit I am biased in this regard, I find to be particularly powerful. Um, there are a wealth of emission lines from every abundant element in the cosmos, and they are all diagnostically useful. So you can see here a thermal spectrum here, and you can tell things about, for example, reflection material, you know, reflected uh, <clears throat> uh, x-rays from the galactic center, you can measure uh, chemical and thermodynamic properties of stellar coronae, clusters, the WIM, interstellar medium. You can look at protostars and stellar flares. A huge amount of science covering practically all of the energetic processes in the cosmos are available to us in the x-rays. But in order to do this, resolution is really key. So here, for example, is a spectrum of a 1 kV plasma mixed with a 1% ionizing plasma at the same temperature. So, so two 1 kV plasmas, one of them out of equilibrium, one in, at a resolution of 1, E over lambda E of 1. So this is roughly equivalent to a proportional counter. So now we'll start the movie. So here it going still proportional counter resolution. Still, proportional counter is getting to be a better proportional counter. Now we're getting into CCD type resolution, or maybe you're used to optical bands. And now we're getting into poor gratings and better gratings, and microcalorimeters. This is about Arcus resolution here, right there. And you can see that at the peak, we can easily tell the difference between the, uh, the two plasmas, that even a 1% plasma is creating a noticeable feature down here at the edge. But 
you need that kind of resolution in order to tell anything at all. Otherwise, you know, here at the, the low resolution, all you get is a, is a hump. Now, it's worth noting, X-ray astronomy did amazing things with proportional counters, and, and Chandra is doing amazing things with CCD. So <clears throat> it's not like there's no science to be done. It's just that there are opportunities with this high resolution that we simply haven't had before. So what are the problems that we're facing? Well, here, for example, is an observation with Hitomi, the sadly short-lived uh, Japanese X-ray microcalorimeter mission of the Perseus cluster. And so this is the iron triplet region here. Uh, and so these are the iron, helium-like iron lines here. And you can see a couple of things here. One of them is, sorry, and they're fit with two different models. One is the red is the Adam DB model, which is the one that uh, Nancy and I and Adam Foster are responsible for. And the blue is our competitors, the specs team from the uh, uh, Dutch group in ESRA. And more or less, you can see we agree, we agree. And then right in here, this intercombination feature here, um, nature was actually very kind to us. You can see that we disagree substantially. And as it happens, some of the data points agree with specs and some of the data points agree with AdamDB. Um, now, <clears throat> that was complete coincidence. These are all just random noise in here. But we don't know which one of these two is right. And this is one of the strongest features in the spectrum. And you can see we both disagree on the resonance feature, but we both don't know whether or not what we're seeing here is, for example, um, resonance line absorption in this feature, or is it simply that our models are incorrect? We don't know. Similar problem here with the Chandra observation of Capella. Now, this is a fairly straightforward model, and perhaps the model isn't adequate enough to model what the actual corona is doing, but you can see that there are some features in here where the lines are simply not at the right wavelengths because we need to improve our wavelengths. So there's a lot of work to be done, both in lines transition energies, line strengths. We need experimental benchmarks for this. How big is this problem? Well, the Hitomi team did a study of this afterwards um, and came up with basically in general, we get temperatures accurate to about 3%, pretty good. Abundance is good to maybe 10 and turbulence good to 10%. So the answer is, it's not disastrous. The plasma codes are actually pretty good. But at the same time, if you wish to do precision work, and that's something that everybody in, in the field is now talking about. Cosmologists speak of precision measurements. We wish to make precision measurements of abundances. Well, this is putting a floor on or a ceiling on what we can do. We really can't do any better than this until we get our plasma codes in better shape. How can we do that? Well, with a electron beam ion trap, here's a picture of the one that we have at CDP. This is a compact device that makes highly charged ions suitable for study, uh, similar to say the plasma of the solar corona. There are only about 20 of these worldwide and most of those are not dedicated to astrophysics. This is the only one that's going to be dedicated to astrophysics. And it's one of the few that's cryogen free, which means we don't have to keep pouring helium into it in order to keep it working. Uh, it, it was bought in 2007, uh, made the first measurement of a, using a photoionization at Argonne in 2010. That was really exciting, except then it developed a silicon oil leak in the vacuum chamber, which was really awful. We started recommissioning it in 2015, <coughs> largely led by my postdoc, Amy Gall, with help from a cast of thousands. And then in 2019, we got first light. Here's a picture of first light. Coming in, this is argon resonance and uh, uh, helium-like argon and hydrogen-like argon in the chamber. And we've also got a microcalorimeter. This is a giant beast of a microcalorimeter, but it does a beautiful job of measuring uh, x-rays, especially at harder X energies. We've got it working again. And here is the first light spectra of the, uh, the microcalorimeter. So our plan is to hook the microcalorimeter up to the EBIT and to start using it to make some of these measurements in the future, uh, in the very near future. The reason I've been highlighting it in this talk is because I'm hoping that we can, <clears throat> we'll not be just using this by ourselves, but that we'll get ideas for what we can do with this microcalorimeter and EBIT uh, from other members of the CFA. 
this is uh, going to be an exciting new opportunity. So with that, back to Arcus. So now <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit about exactly how Arcus is going to do this uh, measurement. And it uses two key breakthroughs, one in what are called critical angle transmission gratings, and the second in silicon bore optics. So what are these and how does it work? Well, <clears throat> at its most simple, as it's already shown, in, shown you in the movies, the X-rays come in through one of these four channels here. Each one of these channels combines both the, the X-ray optics and the gratings. They are then diffracted, so focused, diffracted, travel through the boom, and then land on the detectors back here. So ultimately, fairly simple. Two reflections here and detected here. So looking down the barrel of the Arcus, you can see the four pedals here laid out with their support mechanisms here. The, the boom, 1.8 meters, 8.5 meters in diameter and 12 meters long. So it's a giant boom. And the four orders and the detectors. So what do these look like? Well, here are the four by six, 24 silicon pore optics that we're planning on using. So you can see the silicon pore optics here. Each one of these is about, you can carry one of these in your hand. They're a little bit bigger you know, than your hand, but that's about the size of them. And the way they're made is by layering silicon plates on top of each other. Grooves are cut into the silicon plates and then the silicon plates are pressed into each other at the very precise angles necessary in order to focus the x-rays. There's no glue used. The, the uh, silicon plates are kept so clean that basically the atomic forces grab and hold them once you get them into place with each other. So they are purely held by atomic forces, making these basically <coughs> giant single crystals of silicon after you're completed making them. Then beh behind those, we have the, the cat gratings. Each one of these silicon uh, pore optics will have a pattern of six gratings this size behind it. And you can see they're about the size of a quarter. So these will meet all of our requirements of collecting the x-rays and then diffracting them. Uh, now, one big advantage, you may have heard of the Athena mission. After the um, IXO was not selected by the Decadal, the Europeans went ahead and decided that an X-ray mission was a priority for them. And so ESA's next big mission is called the Athena X-ray Observatory. Athena uses silicon pore optics as well. And as a piece of advice for anybody who wants to build a uh, Explorer mission, I highly recommend having somebody like ESA spending all the money that they've got in order to develop your technology for you. Uh, because it dramatically simplifies your life. So right now, Arcus is using the exact optics that Athena is baseline, using the same focal length, the same radii curvature, the widths, the same coatings, everything is identical. Literally, we could take them off the back of the truck uh, and use them in Arcus. That dramatically reduces cost and schedule risk. Um, it also means that we have a beautiful zero order response on our detectors so the, uh, the zero order of our gratings, the, the direct pass-through, gives us essentially the same area as Chandra Aces I at launch. So we'll have an ability to look at the hard X-rays as well as the soft X-rays that, that Arcus is focusing on. What do these cat gratings look like and why do they have, why are they so good? Well, <clears throat> they are basically just uh, very long, thin bars very finely spaced. The bars are about four microns deep and separated by about 200 nanometers. So they're very narrow, very deep bars. The depth of these is about eight times, uh, sorry, about 10 times deeper than the Chandra HETG. And that's basically where the additional efficiency comes from. The, the uh, Chandra HETG gratings are about 3% efficient. These are about 30% efficient at scattering light. So we got a factor of 10 there. And we read these out in fifth and sixth order as opposed to first and second order with Chandra, or first and third order with Chandra, which means that we have basically four times higher resolution because we're using higher order res uh, readouts. So that gives us more, more efficiency and higher resolution. That is really where the big win comes with Argus. 
Do they work? The answer is yes. You can see them here in the Panther beam line. So back in here, right here, are two aligned silicon core optics. Now these were actually taken from ESA. ESA was doing an alignment test to make sure that they could align their optics for their own uses. And we asked them, hey, after you're finished with your alignment test, would you mind if we borrow them so that we could put some gratings in front of them and see if we can align gratings? And their answer was certain, not a problem. And so here, for example, you can tell the difference. Here is our ray trace of what the observation is supposed to look like. Here's the actual measurement of what the observation looked like. And here you can compare the two and see that we're in great shape, that not only are we able to ray trace the results, that we understand the, the entire system from the get-go. The only thing we don't actually understand about this right now is what the ultimate limiting resolution of the gratings is. And the reason for that is because of, again, a atomic physics problem. You might think that the uh, natural line width of, for example, fluorescing magnesium K-alpha is known. But the answer is it is not. There's actually multiple measurements of it. They disagree with each other quite substantially. All we could tell here was that the ultimate resolution of the gratings was greater than 3,500. But we couldn't tell if it was 10,000 or... Uh, 5,000, or uh, it had to be at least greater than 3,500 at the three sigma level, which was all we required for a specification. But there's a number of things in laboratory astrophysics that are not as well known as you might think, and the natural line widths of fluorescent sources is one of them. Here is the boom. Like I said, it's a monster. This is a it's actually a 10.85 meter boom, 1.85 meters across. You can see a person here for scale. Uh, <clears throat> when you are putting a proposal like this together, there are certain topics that always make the NASA reviewers nervous, and extendable booms is one of them. The only way that we could see to make them less nervous was to actually build and demonstrate a boom for them uh, so that they could actually see it, and it worked. We had these for our first site visit. They came. This was basically the, the standout of the show. They all stared at it and basically came back with the result of, yep, looks like you can make a boom that big. We agree. So we're not going to give you any, grief, any more grief about it. So uh, the Arcus team is ready to go. Here's the, the all the various members of the team and their little logos here. Um, one point, again, switching back to this topic of how do you do a proposal like this? Well, you can't do it by yourself. Nobody is so good to be able to put a proposal like this together by themselves. You need a large team, and you need a large team that's going to be willing to work uh, together well, that, that likes working together well. So it is important as you are going through your career to, if you want to do something like this, uh, start making friends early, start being useful to people. Uh, and, and helping them out with the kind of work that you do and letting them know that you want to be involved in missions. Um, and then perhaps as you, uh, as you advance in your career, you'll get to, be, uh, to a point where you can actually put one of these together. Um, I'll say that it's a lot of work, but it's exciting and it's always, each day is different. And I'll end with um, a traditional NASA quad chart and I'm showing this just to give you an idea of the kind of things that you get to do all the time. Um, you get asked to put together a quad chart, which always means four different things in four different areas. And they usually explain who's involved, what the science is, um, and maybe a, a nice picture or two. Um, as far as I can tell, these are then all packaged up and put into a collection of 50 or 60 such quad charts, one for each mission, uh, that are then shown to NASA headquarters bigwigs uh, in a flash uh, that lasts one minute per slide. They walk away knowing absolutely nothing about 50 or so missions, and the teams all spend hours and hours putting together quad charts. So I wanted to give you an idea of the kind of things that, that I spend my time doing. And this indeed was hours and hours of time spent organizing a quad chart, but it does contain everything that I just told you. So I thought it was a good slide to end on. And with that, I will take any questions you have. Thanks very much. Thanks, Randall. Um, so I can uh, take questions either from the um, race Raise hand, raise hand or from the chat. 
Uh, so Charles, I see has his hand raised. Okay, can you hear me? <clears throat> so I have a question, actually, a very elementary astrophysics question is, for the, for the hot gas, the primary target mission, can you actually determine the abundance of something, of something like oxygen? Because you get one ionization state and you have to have an independent determination of the background hydrogen abundance. So can you actually get a relative abundance of, of oxygen under, under those circumstances? It depends. If you're looking at a thermal plasma where you can get a Bremsstrahlung continuum, then yes, because you'll get the, uh, the absolute um, electron density from the, and, and proton density from the Bremsstrahlung. If you're looking at, say, a photoionized plasma um, or something where the Bremsstrahlung isn't connected to the plasma that you're looking at, then no, you have to either do it indirectly or from a, some, other, um, some other band pass. So you can make, obviously you can make ratios, you can make a carbon to oxygen ratio or an oxygen to oxygen ratio. But if all you've got is say an oxygen absorption line measurement, um, then we have to get the normalizing feature from some other, some other aspect. Um, it's a similar problem you face in, in UV astronomy if you can't get the, uh, the Lyman alpha line, for example. So I see Brandon, um, you'll need to unmute yourself. Oh, yes, yeah, hi. Um, yeah, Randall, I, I just had a quick question. I think if I remember correctly, when you gave one of these talks many years ago, you were uh, also trying to use, I think, uh, the reflective X-ray gratings. Um, do you have any comments on future prospects for that, uh, if, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly? You are remembering correctly. That was a detail I, I sort of skipped over. The original Arcus actually did use reflection gratings. Um, there, are, there are two new grading technologies that have been going neck and neck for some time. And the other one, um, replicated reflection gratings, is being done primarily at Penn State. Um, and we had been using them. At, we then changed to the CAT gratings because at a key point uh, in the last proposal uh, around the, we had a test observations of both the reflection gratings and the CAT gratings at um, Marshall Space Flight Center. And unfortunately, the reflection gratings had a significant problem at the time due to how they were being made, uh, the, the nanotechnology that was being used at the time. They, as a result, their resolution was limited, I believe, to like 600 or so, which wasn't going to be good enough in order to get the Arcus requirements done. And at the same time, it just so happened that the CAT gratings had a breakthrough and um, achieved much higher resolution uh, <clears throat> and did a far better job. And so we switched, uh, which was a very nerve wracking period in Arcus's history because we had been focused on the reflection gratings for some time. Since then, the reflection gratings have overcome that problem and are now getting um, very good results. And they're actually working on an interesting effort to make reflections, building the grooves of the reflection grating into the silicon pore optics themselves. So you're simultaneously focusing and diffracting the light. Um, and that looks really exciting, but it's still uh, in progress. So uh, one of the things, I mean, Arcus will not be switching again. It's, a, it's like I said, a nerve wracking process to change your technologies. But yeah, they're, they're, uh, that's group work is being led by Randy McIntyre and they're definitely making a lot of progress. So the, the CAT gratings are being um, built by the team at MIT um, with help from Lincoln Laboratories. So do we, I don't, does anybody else have a question? Oh, Charles again. Go ahead, you have to unmute. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. So I, I can't help myself because uh, it's, it, I love the adventure story aspect of, 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 of a mission like this. So one development that nearly undid a previous mission of ours Parker, with Parker Solar Probe was the vibration during launch. Um, which turned out to be more severe than anticipated in the first round designs. So the, these, these optics look beautiful. They also look very microscopic and frankly fragile. Um, how confident are you that they'll withstand the, 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 the vibration during launch or any other time where they get badly treated? 
Um, actually, that has been a major concern of ESAs as well. And so they have a um, have been doing a huge amount of testing of that. It turns out actually, though, that they are remarkably robust. Um, and I, I've actually seen an example of that. Um, it's a non-standard test, but I was at a AAS meeting where we were promoting um, IXO and they had one of these optics there to hand around to people. Um, and a NASA headquarters project program manager was there and picked up the optic in order to look at it and look through it and see the, the light coming through it and proceeded to drop it on the table uh, from a height of about three feet. And all it did was sort of crack the corner of the optic, completely freaking out the, uh, the person from Cosine Optics who had built the optic in the first place. But it actually came through with minor damage and it still worked. Um, so the answer is the optics are remarkably robust. And more seriously, they have done a huge amount of testing, both shock and vibration testing. And they meet standards that are vastly higher than what we're going to hit with the Arcus launch. Um, fortunately, we're expecting to launch in a Falcon 9. That's a fairly smooth ride. And these are buried deep within the instrument. So they will not be seeing a huge amount of vibration. The ones that are sort of thin, obviously, are the gratings themselves at, at four microns. Um, but we've actually been manipulating them by hand for some time now. So we have a fair amount of experience moving them back and forth carefully. And our expectation is that they're going to survive. We have put them through some shaped and vibration tests already. Um, and they, they've held up. So it's a concern, but it's one that uh, that we seem to be in pretty good shape on. Okay, thank you. Sure. Roseanne? Oh, hi, Randall. That was a great talk. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the science, and it, it, you have a wonderful science case. Um, if you were lucky enough to see double AGN, Mm -hmm. would you be sensitive to redshifts? And, and I know that's a general question because it depends on their masses, mass ratio and separation and orientation. But is this a, an element of science where there, there's some part of the parameter space that you could explore? You mean the, the basically be able to tell the difference in the velocities of the two AGM? Well, I guess uh, if you saw even one of the AGN um, undergoing red and blue shifts, you would have a clue then. Um, I can tell you what our limiting resolution is. We can detect um, velocity shifts as small as 20 kilometers a second. Mm -hmm. um, I must admit, I don't know the science of, of dual AGNs well enough to know if that's going to be sensitive enough in order to distinguish between the two or to, to make a, a useful measurement. But we could certainly make, make measurements at the, you know, if for example, there were features at 20, 20 kilometers a second, we could tell the shifts of that size. Yeah, that, that's interesting. And it, it's something to look into because we're looking into it now from the perspective of gravitational lensing of one black hole by the other. Mm. And all of the complementary ways that one can look at this, they, you know, would, be able to tell you more about the population as a whole. Yeah, no, that's a good point. One thing that I didn't emphasize, although I perhaps should have, is that although the way that NASA asks you to propose these missions is to have a focused science case for a modest amount of time. And so the science case that I just described would be done in less than two years worth of observing time. Mm -hmm. The mission, however, is designed to last for at least 10 years. So we're fully expecting that after we finish the main science case, like most other telescopes of this nature, it would then go open for guest observers uh, from anywhere to, uh, to propose and use the telescope. And we're certain that there's lots of other science that you can do with this. Thank you. Yep. More questions? So I have a question, Randall. Um, okay. So one of the other really great slides is the science traceability matrix. 
And I was wondering if you didn't mention the exoplanet case, but I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what what gets you into the science traceability matrix, which means you have a part of the science case or not, and how that exoplanet case came about. So I can at least point it out here. So the exoplanet transits are in here. So we will be looking at exoplanet transits and this just got omitted because <clears throat> I only had so much time in the talk, but the science is looking at the uh, uh, outer atmospheres of especially uh, hot Jupiters, because unlike say optical light, where it's the optical light from the star tends to get cut off as soon as you get through into the atmosphere um, of, this, of the planet, the X-rays will penetrate down to a fairly deep depth. And so you will see a, a energy dependent change in the eclipse as the planet goes in front of the star. So you could imagine looking at this as a function of energy and especially with the high resolution we've got here, looking at the edges to measure not only what the height of the atmosphere is of the planet, but also the height as a function of the element that you're looking at in the planet. That requires, for example, that you be able to measure the, the change, basically the, the, uh, the eclipse depth um, in a fraction in some number of passes. So you need to have an X-ray, a star that's X, at least so X-ray bright. You need to have a telescope that has at least a certain amount of sensitivity in a particular band uh, and the ability to um, make a measurement in a sufficiently short period of time. So all of that then flows into a science case that you'd like to do. Do we have the capability in this instrument in order to do it? What requirement does that place on our science that we want to do? And that goes through, this is a truly painstaking calculation to do, putting together this traceability matrix, but it basically dominates everything that, that you set up here. So for example, the case that I was talking about here at the very beginning, where I was talking about the equivalent widths, we realized fairly early on that we needed to get down to at least three milliangstroms and ideally one milliangstrom equivalent widths um, in order to make the measurements that we wanted to measure. And that set a lot of the properties of the telescope itself. Um, because if you can't do that, that was going to limit what, what science we could do. And that, for example, was one of the things that told us when, for example, that we had to make the switch from reflection gratings to cap gratings <clears throat> was that we knew we had to get down to at least three milliangstroms. And at least with the initial version of the reflection gratings, we weren't gonna make that. So putting together a science traceability matrix is a truly awful exercise, but absolutely essential. I'm not sure I Oops. understand. And my watch is talking to me. Uh, and if anybody would like to know more about it, I'm happy to talk to them uh, offline about the process of developing a mission. Okay, so we're close to the time. Is there one more question? I don't see any more questions. So I think we should uh, thank Randall again for th this great talk on Arcus and wish us all luck on uh, winning uh, as we go forward. Um, it would be great. And uh, Randall's virtually here so you know if you have questions don't oh charles has another charles wants to say something else you have to unmute actually i was just trying to uh, give a positive reaction so <laughs> okay okay i'm sorry a thumbs up good. yes thank you thumbs up but anyway <laughs> okay it, it, was, it was a lot of fun thank you all right so thank you thank you all bye